And this mother, oh, she labored beautifully. The dim lights in her house. She's in the the birthing pool. Her husband's beside her holding her hand. Um, The midwife is rubbing her back and we've got a washcloth over her forehead. The lights are dim and she's got little twinkle lights up in her living room, which apparently she had kept there from her first birth. So they had been there the entire time. We arrive at her house quickly and quietly unpack everything, prepare the space for birth. And uh, about an hour after we get there, the mom begins to push. And about 10 minutes later, the baby is out. This baby comes out beautifully, no problems at all. And then (laughs) she's skin to skin for the first two hours. We go in to do the newborn examination where we fully check the baby, you know, head to toe. Are there any issues, any complications and check their weight. This baby was 10 pounds, eight ounces (laughs) and born beautifully, no complications, no tearing, which is truly something that I hear so many mothers concerned about. And and really that it's all related to how you're supported during birth and what position you're allowed, quote unquote, to give birth in. From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. Hey guys, I'm Hilda Labrada Gore, and this is episode 187. Our guest today is Caitlin Fusco. Caitlin has trained as a student midwife and is the creator and host of the podcast Happy Home Birth. Caitlin is a wife and mother of two herself, who is on a mission to spread awareness about the safety and beauty of giving birth at home. Caitlin holds dear the practices of nutritional eating, fitness, and peaceful parenting. We are thrilled to have her on the show today because Caitlin explains how home births have been historically a wise tradition. She goes into why we moved away from it in the first place and what the consequences have been. She gives insights into how it can be a safe choice for low-risk pregnancies and why she finds it so warm and natural. There is something for everyone on today's episode. Whether you are considering a home birth in the future for yourself or whether you simply want insights on its pros and cons. Before we get into it, a quick thank you and a request. First, thank you for listening to the show. You guys, we are really close to the milestone of 2 million downloads. It is really thrilling. And we are so thankful that you've been with us the whole way through. And we want to simply ask you to do one of two things. Either make a contribution of any size in honor of this approaching milestone just by going on our website and giving a gift of any size. Because you know we have ads on the show from time to time, but they don't really cover all of the costs associated with producing the program. Or rate and review us on iTunes. This is also a gift to us and lets people know that the show is worth listening to. So make your choice and thanks in advance. Also a big thank you to our sponsor Ancestral Supplements, the makers of gallbladder with ox bile. Based on the ancient wisdom of like supports like, they put New Zealand sourced nose to tail organ meats and bone marrow in convenient gelatin capsules. Order yours today at ancestralsupplements.com. Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. This is Holistic Hilda and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Caitlin. Oh, thank you so much for having me on, Hilda. I am so excited to talk to you. I understand you are at this moment 35 and a half weeks pregnant. Is that right? That is correct. This is baby number two. So we decided to go for it again. Oh, that's wonderful. Now with baby number one, did you have a home birth? I did. I actually did. So I was working as a student midwife and a a midwife's apprentice before becoming pregnant with my first. And so it was really a pretty natural choice for me. I I didn't have the, the concerns that perhaps some other mothers who don't know about home birth would have. Um, so I was very excited to go into my first birth and have a home birth. What was that experience like for you? 
Oh, it was incredible. I mean, the reason I have so much love for home birth was really because I had experienced it on the side of being a student midwife. And I had seen these mothers having these beautiful experiences where they're at home, they're supported, they're cared for, and they're safe. And I knew that that's what I wanted. And then experiencing it on the other end, there are just, you know, there are no words. And so that's kind of how I became a, what I call myself as a home birth advocate. So what do you mean experience it on the other end? Oh, you mean as a, as an observer and then being the person having, (laughs) okay. okay. Exactly. So being, so the difference between, you know, being with these mothers during this phenomenal transformative time, you know, going from being pregnant to actually having the baby, uh, being there for that experience was incredible. But then once it was me, it made it, you know, a thousand times even more precious to me. Well, what is the history, Caitlin, of giving birth at home? Well, you know, when you think about it, it is the oldest of the wise traditions. You know, <laughs> we've been we've been giving birth as women from the very beginning, and that's how we all got here. It's how the planet was populated. Only very, very recently, when you think of the timeline, um, have we been giving birth in places other than the home, in the hospital. And the hospital, I will say, of course, is phenomenal for emergencies. It's phenomenal for high-risk moms. But when we look at the overall population, that's only 10% of mothers. So low-risk mothers do an amazing job giving birth at home. And there are actually studies now that are showing this. Thank goodness, because we've been saying it for a long time. But now here's the scientific evidence showing how how incredible home birth is for mothers. And one of the great examples of this is the cesarean, the C-section rate for home birth mothers is about 5.2% of births compared to 31% of births in the hospital setting. Why do you think that is? Well, so I really feel like it begins with this idea of control and the cookie cutter mold. You know, when it comes to an obstetrician's office, they're very, very busy people. And they see so many people that that the amount of time that they can spend with each individual person is very limited. They also are taught to use medications and they're surgeons. You know, the the main thing that they're learning in, in school is surgery, which they're great at. But natural, normal, physiological birth, not so much. So what tends to happen is a mom will start by getting induced oftentimes with synthetic oxytocin called Pitocin. And, you know, that kind of begins the what we call the cascade of interventions. So she receives Pitocin, contractions get very intense, not the same type of contractions that a mother would experience were she not using Pitocin. Uh, there are usually two peaks in it. They're just very strong, one on top of the other without a break in between. So then the mom is just exhausted and and can't handle the, the physical discomfort, understandably, and then would like to have an epidural. The epidural then comes with its own risk factors, one of the things being that it slows the body down completely. So then oftentimes doctors say, oh, well, we need more Pitocin. So they're going to pump even more, which Mm. causes distress in the baby many times. The heart rate will decelerate. And then the doctor says, oh no, you know, the baby's in danger now. And then you have to be whisked away to have a C-section that could have been prevented had we just not started the interventions in the first place. Yeah, I remember when I was preparing for my own births and I was trying to avoid that cascade of interventions. As a matter of fact, when I first got to the hospital, because I did have hospital births, I remember saying, I don't want an IV. You know, Mm -hmm. I want to suck on ice chips. And you really have to advocate for yourself. And I guess whatever circumstance you're in, you want to make sure you're making the choices that best protect the baby and are best for you. Oh, certainly. And that's, I feel like that's a great point that you bring up, Hilda, is you, of course, still can have a natural childbirth in the hospital. And that's amazing. If that's where you feel comfortable, then go for it. I would, of course, recommend a childbirth education class. I would recommend a doula. But the thing about having a birth at home and using a midwife is that many of the things that we naturally minded parents, I say this to you know members of the Weston A. Price Foundation, very naturally minded generally, the things that are that we're wanting at the hospital, like delayed cord clamping, skin-to-skin contact, 
laboring in whatever position you desire, that's all standard of care when you use a midwife and when you're outside of the hospital. So when you're going into the hospital, oftentimes you find yourself having to advocate and fight for yourself to get these things. Whereas when you're at home, this is just how it is and it can be a beautiful experience. So Caitlin, when did this shift occur from home births to hospital? So really, it was in the 1900s. As the 1900s progressed towards the 1950s, more and more people were having their births in the hospitals. So, you know, you think about time, that's really not a very long time. And unfortunately, the history of obstetrics is not a very fun one. You know, you can look at documentaries such as The Business of Being Born is one that moms love. And it kind of takes a a glimpse into this history and, you know, moms were put into what was called twilight sleep, given very heavy drugs, were not awake for the birth of their children. Um, it, it really has caused a disconnect in bonding. And so now, luckily, you know, the past few years, home birth has been gaining more and more attention. And I'm so grateful for that because, you know, bonding with your baby is an integral part of life. And if we get that initial bond, then it just sets us up for success in parenthood and really in success for just raising the next generation of loving humans. And also speaking of bonding, isn't like our DNA all over our home so Mm -hmm. that when you have that baby, it's surrounded by the parent and the familial DNA as opposed to being in a hospital where things are quite sterile or it's unfamiliar bacteria and stuff. Is that right? Oh, I love that you bring that up, Hilda. That is absolutely correct. That's one of the biggest issues is, you know, we think about, oh, well, the hospital is is a safe place. Well, the hospital is full of sick people. And as a pregnant woman, you're not sick. You have a beautiful condition called pregnancy. <laughs> so our homes, our our homes are where we spend our time. Our homes are where this baby was made, where this mother has been for these nine months. And the microbes that are surrounding are the ones that the mom is used to and akin to and are inside of her body and actually inside the amniotic fluid that the baby is floating around in and actually swallowing and breathing in. So the baby is completely accustomed to all of the things related to your home. So once he or she arrives and is earthside, they're in a very familiar habitat. And that is is a very safe thing. I love that you call it earthside when they when they leave the womb and and enter the earth. That's beautiful. Right? What what an, an amazing transition. Well, you know, you mentioned earlier how uh, home births are trending now. Again, people are returning to this wise tradition. I heard that even the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, Meghan Markle and Prince Harry are said to have had a home birth. It's so amazing. Now, why do you think the trend is to come back to this? I love that. And I am so glad that that this has brought home birth back to the forefront. And, and like I said, it has been kind of coming on the rise. People have talked about it more and more. Although one of the things that I read recently was how the ACOG, last ACOG meeting was kind of making fun of Meghan Markle for having this home birth and calling it unsafe. Um, but like I said, the research is, is coming out and it's very clear that the women who are low risk are having amazing outcomes. They're having safe outcomes. And and not only just during the birthing time, but over the next few weeks and the increase of breastfeeding is, is elevated. I mean, when you have a home birth, the chances of you breastfeeding at week six are increased. So this is affecting so much more than just the actual birthing time. And with Megan having potentially that home birth, it has brought a lot of debate back and forth. But I would like to say, especially in the United States, it's still a vast minority of of women giving birth outside of the hospital. It's actually less than 2% of moms who give birth either in a birth center that is freestanding or at home. Less than 2%. That number surprises me. It's an incredibly low amount. And I think that the problem is that women aren't realizing that it's a safe option. And that's what my podcast is about. That's what my goal has really been about is to inform women, hey, this is this doesn't have to be your choice, but this is a really cool option. And you might not have realized it's safe. It really is. And it, it can be very beautiful as well. 
Well, let's talk about the safety because that's probably first and foremost in any young mom's mind. Absolutely. Yes. And, and that's something that, you know, I've, you always think of the hospital as being the safe place. But when we look at the the percentages, as I mentioned, you know, 5% risk of cesarean section versus the, the national average of 31%, major abdominal surgery is not, you know, not the preference. So when we step back and take things to midwives who are trained in in the actual normal physiological process of birth, we're seeing incredible results. Coming up, Caitlin talks to us about the training and education of midwives and their impact on positive maternal outcomes. You're listening to the Wise Traditions Podcast from the Weston A. Price Foundation. We pause now to recognize our sponsors. Mike, the Heal Your Gut Guy. Are you dealing with digestive issues? Do you react to delicious sourdough bread and other starches? Do you pay dearly when you eat cheat foods? Mike, the Heal Your Gut Guy, also suffered from these issues, even when following Weston A. Price dietary principles. Mike will show you the extra steps he took to heal himself and how he helps many others take care of gut issues like Crohn's, colitis, IBS, SIBO, and Candida. Mike will show you how to heal your gut 100% naturally without drugs. The Heal Your Gut Guy YouTube channel page has the videos you need to heal your gut. You don't have to walk a dietary tightrope. Just search for the Heal Your Gut Guy on YouTube. You'll find tons of free information rooted in the laws of Mother Nature and ancestral wisdom. And gallbladder with ox bile by Ancestral Supplements. Ancestral Supplements offer New Zealand sourced, nose to tail organ meats, bone marrow, and gallbladder with ox bile in simple, convenient gelatin capsules. Our early Native American ancestors would commonly take a buffalo cut it open on the spot, and eat the warm liver seasoned with gallbladder and bile. The bile was sprinkled on various organs and glands as a condiment, the way we might use mustard today. Word has it that gallbladder and bile did a whole lot more than just improve the taste. Gallbladder, ox bile, and liver provided concentrated amounts of gallbladder-specific building blocks, bile and liver, that support our biliary tract, gallbladder, liver, bile ducts, and they are now absent from the modern diet. So visit ancestralsupplements.com to see what they can do for you. Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. So a few things that I wanted to discuss is the training that midwives go through. Many people think of, you know, think, wait, midwives, I I didn't think they existed anymore. (laughs) Uh, You know, it's just, it's like, oh, that's so outdated. But no, they have very strong training. They have a didactic educational component. And then they have a very long apprenticeship where they attend hundreds of births and see all kinds of, quote, complications and different variations of what birth can be like. They also typically offer the same types of tests and checks as a traditional obstetrician during the prenatal experience. So I think that's another concern is, you know, moms would think, oh, well, you know, I just, I just want to make sure I can get all of the testing. I want to make sure that my baby is safe. And that's completely reasonable. And Mm -hmm. luckily midwives do provide that because they're medical professionals. Another thing that I wanted to mention was how midwives are required to remain certified in life-saving maneuvers like CPR and neonatal resuscitation. So if an emergency were to arise, they are trained and they are trained in those life-saving maneuvers and they carry so much equipment, Hilda. Oh my word. I remember <laughs> my husband laughing when, when my midwife came in with these massive bags and he was like, what is all of this stuff? Well, it's, it's medical equipment. It's also herbs. It's medication for oxygen. If the baby were to need a little bit of oxygen once he or she was born and synthetic oxytocin, pitocin, not for, you know, labor, but for if the mom were to have a little too much bleeding postpartum, that is, that's what would be used in either the hospital or at home. Um, So that kind of stigma that, oh, you know, a midwife just wouldn't be able to take care of emergencies. Oh no, she is incredibly prepared 
And she is spending so much time with these moms prenatally. You know, you go to the OB and you might see him for five to 15 minutes during an appointment, but a midwife's appointment is typically 30 minutes to an hour. So she's spotting red flags. She's focusing on preventative care and and prenatal nutrition, which is just so important, but oftentimes overlooked in a a traditional hospital setting, um, really making home birth such a safe option for low-risk mothers. Well, you've made a really good case for how it is safe. And and, and it actually sounds also to me very beautiful as kind of an intuitive person and a, and a creative person and a f- person that's strong on the feeling side. I'm just picturing some of these amazing home births. Can you describe one experience that you witnessed that was particularly powerful? Oh, absolutely. It's hard to choose one, but I, I have a very recent one in mind that I'll tell you about. And this will really give some encouragement to, to moms who have perhaps been told, oh, well, your baby's just you know too big. So recently, I got to go to a home birth of a client who I had attended her first birth. It was her second birth, and I got to go. And this mother, oh, she labored beautifully. The dim lights in her house, she's in the, the birthing pool. Her husband's beside her holding her hand. Um, the midwife is rubbing her back, and we've got a washcloth over her forehead. The lights are dim, and she's got little twinkle lights up in her living room, which apparently she had kept there from her first birth. So they had been there the entire time. We arrive at her house, quickly and quietly unpack everything, prepare the space for birth. And uh, about an hour after we get there, the mom begins to push. And about 10 minutes later, the baby is out. This baby comes out beautifully, no problems at all. And then (laughs) She's skin to skin for the first two hours. We go in to do the newborn examination where we fully check the baby, you know, head to toe. Are there any issues, any complications and check their weight? This baby was 10 pounds, eight ounces. (laughs) (sighs) Wow. Yes. And born beautifully, no complications, no tearing, which is truly something that I hear so many mothers concerned about. And and really that it's all related to how you're supported during birth and what position you're allowed, quote unquote, to give birth in. So, you know, the pelvis is an amazing thing and it it opens and allows for space for a baby to pass through. And And we think that it's so complicated, but our bodies know exactly what they're doing. Wow, that sounds amazing and wonderful. Now, I want you to describe to us a story where there maybe was a complication and what the midwife did to help out. Oh, absolutely. So so though it doesn't happen often because, like I said, with the prenatal care, we're really checking to make sure that risks don't come up during the birthing time. You know, if there is a problem, it's going to be typically spotted before. And then during birth, rarely is it an emergent situation where the transfer to the hospital is, you know, accompanied by an ambulance. It's okay, well, let's just get in the car and we'll head on over. But one of the things that happened, I remember a few years ago was a mom was was laboring with her second baby. She was doing really well. Um, but once her water broke, we noticed that there was some meconium in the water. And it was rather thick. And meconium, for those of you who don't know, is the the buildup. It's the baby's first poop, really. <laughs> um, yeah. But the issue with that sometimes is if the baby does that before being born, then he can aspirate that and, and it can cause some complications. So with this mother, that was a situation that happened. We assessed it and discussed back and forth with her what she would prefer to do. And her preference was, okay, well, let's just have a nice transport to the hospital before there are any complications. And so that the baby can be around medical equipment should he need it. And so we did. We all went to the hospital together. Her midwife stayed with her and myself as the apprentice, I stayed as well and were able to support her, you know, just in a very similar manner, um, but with with a doctor there on call, should there be a complication? And she gave birth. It was beautiful. Everything was fine. The baby didn't need any help, but we were there should a a situation have arisen. Well, it sounds like all the pieces are in place when people 
do hit a complication, there are ways to handle it and maybe even ways to take care of it naturally without too many interventions, which may happen in a conventional setting. That brings me back, Caitlin, to something you said earlier. You mentioned ACOG. Who is ACOG and why would they be skeptical of home births? Yes. So ACOG is the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. And, you know, of course, that's they're focusing on, on hospital births. And so a lot of their information is related to it's it's scary. You know, it's related to all of the fears and concerns around birth. But, you know, one of the issues is that for the United States to be such a developed country, we actually have one of the worst maternal outcomes of all developed countries. Um, really? We do. It's, it's, a, it's very alarming. Um, and so the, what we what we need to be considering and thinking about is what are we doing that's different from these other developed countries who have maternal outcome rates that are just so much better. And one of the big things is that even in the hospital systems, we're not using midwives. You know, you look over in the UK and midwives are pretty common for most births. Uh, Same with Japan. So, you know, all of these other places understand that a midwife's role is to help mothers who are low risk uh, give birth safely and naturally. And then an obstetrician's job really should be to be there should something go awry in those small cases when it will, which of course it will and and thank goodness for them. Um, But for them to be handling every single birth, it just doesn't make sense. Wow. So maybe that midwife piece is something we should implement here. Do you think ACOG would say okay uh, to making this a practice to improve the outcome for mothers in the U.S.? You know, I think that's a great question. I'd, I'd love to ask them. But I will say, at least locally, something that I've noticed that is really beautiful, there's actually an obstetrician in my area in Greenville, South Carolina, where, you know, he is asking for midwives to, to join his practice. He wants them. And so I have seen there is a, a slight trend upward, it seems, um, for hospitals to begin including midwives, even though it's not, you know, common, it's not most hospitals, it, it's happening. And, and midwives are showing up on the scene more and more. And I know that that's only going to affect outcomes in a very positive way. Well, this has been a super positive conversation. I'm so glad you were able to join us today, Caitlin. I want to ask you one last question. What advice would you give the listener who is considering a home birth? Uh, I would give the listener the advice of please just go into motherhood like you do anything else prepared. Know why you're making the decisions that you're making and research them. You know, a lot of times in in our culture, we spend so much time thinking about the baby's nursery and what's the baby's name going to be. And these things are all so important, but let's really take that time to focus and consider what is our labor going to be like? What is our prenatal care going to be like? How are we going to plan for our postpartum experience? Because these are all things that we'll never forget. You know, you will never forget the day that your baby is born. You'll never forget how you were treated. You'll never forget who was there to support you. So make sure that you are doing the research beforehand and I've got plenty of re- of resources on my website and on Instagram, so be sure to to check that out. You're welcome to come follow along on my podcast as well. That's the main thing, though, is is really prepare yourself the way that you would prepare for anything else important to you. Fantastic. So we will put a link in the show notes for folks to find you on your website and where they can follow you on Instagram. And I hope this does inspire people to go the natural, wise traditions way when they're giving birth. So thanks again, Caitlin. Thank you so much for having me on, Hilda. My pleasure. Our guest today was Caitlin Fusco. Check out her website, myhappyhomebirth.com and follow her on Instagram at happyhomebirthpodcast. And I'm Holistic Hilda. You can find me on Instagram at Holistic Hilda. For the complete show notes for this and all podcast episodes, just go to our website, westonaprice.org. And that's it. Let's keep in touch, everybody, and see you next time. On behalf of the Weston A. Price Foundation, thanks for listening. We have many free resources to support you on your health journey. 
Visit WestonAPrice.org to find podcasts, articles, videos, and more. You can also find a local chapter near you for help in finding sources of great food. We invite you to support the Foundation's mission of education, research, and activism by becoming a member. Thanks again, and take care. Wise Traditions is a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. The content on this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professional. It is not intended to be, nor does it constitute healthcare or medical advice.